All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to second to last week of class. Everyone excited? Semester's almost done. Yay. It's a lot. It does get picked up on the microphone, but they are just going wild here. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, I'll be here Monday, Wednesday. Unfortunately, I'm out of town next week. So Connor's going to teach class and clean up uh, then on binary security. I think we'll be done with content probably by next Monday, but we'll see what happens. We'll extend stuff into Wednesday. Uh, as mentioned, because I guess some people don't watch things, although I guess if you didn't watch it on Wednesday, why would I expect you to watch today on Monday? But uh, release two modules as we all agreed on collaboratively on Wednesday. The final two modules, web security and binary exploitation. Uh, one important note, since that got brought up, if you, am I not logged in? Sorry, let's go course. Okay, you're gonna see my grade. I'm failing this course, by the way, in case you were wondering. Um, <clears throat> undergrades, so you have the weight here, this weight, because it's all the same means nothing. This is just a relative weight between the modules. So the fact that they're all eight doesn't mean anything. They could be all one, which I'll probably just change them to, although that will still be confusing to people. It could be all nines, it could be all a thousands. It really doesn't matter. It's literally just that way, uh, if we want, if when running this course, if I had wanted to say, oh, talking web is worth twice as much as the other modules, that'd be a two and the other ones would be worth one, something like that, right? So. But for our purposes here, it literally doesn't matter at all. So as stated, your grade is here. Uh, I will this week before Wednesday post your current status of extra credit in terms of memes and thanks. Uh, I'll also pull down the latest um, code breaker challenges that were on the syllabus too and put them on here. That way, like as stated on Wednesday, these have the latest possible deadline of January 10th. Like grades are due the next day, so that's why everything gets cut off at midnight of the 10th. This means absolute whatever I put in the Discord. So before I start talking about stuff that's on there, let me make sure I'm not I'm saying the same content. Uh, but it means very simply that uh, absolutely no extension. So like it's just fundamentally impossible. Any extensions there go into over, and we need to deal with like medical incompletes and other kinds of things. So if you've been thinking about that, don't think about that. Like. If you end up in that situation, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Uh, during finals week, no in-person help. So finals week is in three weeks, right? So second week of class, last week of class, and then finals week. So finals week, no office hours, no recitations. Um, and I kind of can't force anyone to be here because it's they also have finals to take and everything. So you're kind of on your own on the discords and you're feel free to help each other, but don't go overboard as normal. I don't know, just this way with this, whatever grade you're happy with here that shows up here, that's gonna be your grade unless, and it can only go higher with extra credit. So as soon as you feel like you're done, then you can just be done. It's kind of think of having a button. You just say like, I'm done. And then you can't ever get a better grade. That way you can lock in and not be, feel like you have to do this until the 10th. Any questions on this? End of semester class stuff. Sorry, I just realized I was not on the 15 people on Twitch. Okay, Is there no hands. All right, now let's get to learning. Cool, so we left off on command injection. So command injection, as we hopefully recall, is when a, most of the things we're talking about here are web applications, but when an application takes our input, concatenates it with other strings, and then passes it to something like system, which then gets reparsed by bin sh, just as if we had typed this in on the command line. So we saw different types of and ways to exploit this. Um, I'm not gonna go over these because we went over them on uh, Wednesday, and you can watch that lecture. I think the key thing, because I've seen some people maybe struggle in the Discord, the key issue here is to think you have full and total power here, right? So this, whatever you're typing in here, once you can execute a command, it is if you were, in our case, the root user and you're tricking the root user to type in whatever the heck you want. 
So even if, like in this case, we saw um, maybe running a certain command maybe didn't show the whole flag or we weren't able to actually extract the flag that way, but we're still root. We can do whatever we want. What are some things maybe that we would want to do at a high level without talking about specific commands to accomplish our goal? What is our goal? Let's go one level up. What is our goal? On the challenges. What's always your goal? You've been doing this for eight, seven modules. This has been a key chunk of your life. Yeah. Get the flag. Yeah. So if you can't just output it directly by doing like cat flag because the program doesn't necessarily give you that output, what other things could you do? You could run ls, but you need to get the output. So the question is, how do you get the output? So if you can't, if you, if you can run commands without getting the output, how could you get the flag? You had a whole module on this about accessing stuff with control. Yeah. Uh, move it to a different file that you can change. Yeah, move it to a different file. Like there's nothing that says that it has to be in that file. So you can move it or copy it or alter the permissions. You could alter the permissions of the destination file. You could fundamentally do anything you wanted to do as that root user. So you could uh, do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, but yeah. So think creatively, like as if you were as root there, you can't get the output of the command, but you want to get that file eventually. Cool. Okay. Moving to HTML. Yes. Question. So this example, you said you seek the user. Sure. But like for that, you only like set the user to the user. You are running as root. Set UID is only so that copy would run as root, right? So the uh, the fact is you are fundamentally running as root when you can trick the, the challenge binary, the challenge web server is running as root, so it can do anything. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Wow, super weird that nobody is sitting over there. Did you all do that on purpose? Nobody wanted to sit on that third of the room? Just all gravitated over here weirdly. Okay. It's because they're from the door. But some people come in that way. Is it locked right now? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. You're over there. I am over. I mean, obviously it makes sense, but it's very weird because most people have sat over there. Anyways, okay. This is what happens when it's close to Thanksgiving. Okay, so Are other. Huh? Are you trying to get? No, this has been a whole room. You guys have been normally equally-ish spread out in, in the terms of this room. Nobody has to sit over there. Don't move, because all your stuff's there. That's a false uh, false move. But, uh... Yeah, look, you have such a good, uh, better view of the screen there. Anyways, sorry, I noticed these things. Okay, so other things. So we talked about HTML, right? HTML is a web application's way of specifying to the user what the structure of the document should look like what links they can click on, what forms they can fill out, what things they can do to the web application. And so very often a web application will create its HTML response by again, concatenating strings together. So here is an example application that has in between P tags, has a string hello comma, and then some name in red being the user's input. So why might this functionality exist? You're writing an application. Have you ever seen a website do this? I can start calling on people. Does that help? Start at the left side of the room and go. 
Yeah, so the idea of being now it's a dynamics website that nicely greets the user, right? So depending on who the user is, how they're logged in, right? We can see, oh, it's this user, great. I can be a friendly application. I can say hello to that specific person. Maybe like, so maybe the results that I give are also unique to that user. So the feed that I'm showing, whatever, if it's like a Facebook newsfeed thing or a whatever. But the point is like, I can customize my HTML response to each of you depending on who you are. Now, the problem is if that input comes directly from the user, now, fundamentally, I can control and, and have any code that I want be executed there. And one of the key things, so again, if we go back to, let me look at, I think it's here. Yeah, so we look back at HTML, right? So now if I can inject content and control the structure of this HTML page, I can get it to be whatever I want. Now, does it seem, seem that exciting? Maybe I can add more links to the page or something, or I don't know, get them to trick, trick them to click on something. Um, but a key thing that we can make them do is, ooh, do I not have? Uh, one of the key things that we can do is actually get them to execute some code that will run inside of their browser, which actually sounds insane. Um, and it's because it is every time your browser accesses a web page, almost every single page will send you some code that your browser running on your machine interprets and executes whatever code that website sends. Um, and that is JavaScript. So let's look at, I guess we can look at here. There is some JavaScript in here, yes? Where I start poking around. I can't remember how this works. Sources, I think. Scripts. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So there's a ton of JavaScript. This is all JavaScript that's executed every time you visit any uh, site on Pwn College. Similar style uh, JavaScript exists everywhere else. But the point is, this is code that is running inside of your browser and has access to everything uh, inside of this web page. So, oops, hello. Okay, let me show an example. Okay, I am going to increase the font size here. Okay, let's go back to our example. Cool. Okay, so this isn't really a dynamic website. This is literally just gonna be me editing a text file and then us loading that text file in our browser. Uh, let's see if I can. Cool. Everyone see on the right, I have this. So if we pass in the name of uh, CSE 365, refresh, right? So just like a dynamic website, so my browser is parsing this. And again, because it's a parser, it has to figure out where are those starting and ending tags. So we can do cool things like uh, we can change our, we can change our name and make it into a link that the user can click. Um, can I change what happens before here? No, I can't because this is a constant string that is concatenated. So I can't control what happens before and I can't control what happens afterwards, right? So every time we're thinking about injection, we need to be thinking about what parts do I control and what parts don't I control? So here I'm controlling just this name in here. Um, I could really uh, mess things up. I could do maybe ending HTML And then the page looks literally like this. Oh, where's the inspect source, so page source. Yeah, so now it's kind of like, depends on how the parser is gonna interpret this. Will it like do this as the end of the page? Will it keep showing the stuff that's after? Let's check if I write something after here. I actually do see that, that's really weird. I'm not 
sure if this is common for all browser engines. Um, I can start another, yeah, HTML tag, and then what if I end this one? Anyways, the point is I can completely control everything that happens here. But one of the big things I would wanna do is start executing JavaScript. So uh, JavaScript was, I, I, I'm gonna go back and we're gonna go back in time, okay. Since I know we got a little bit of time, we can do this. Ah, there we go. Cool. So this was the modern HTML that we've been looking at. Very static, has images, tables. You can set font size. But fundamentally, the content was static. And this actually gave rise to early websites like Yahoo. Did you guys know Yahoo was literally just a lit, uh, like a yellow pages or a directory for the internet. So there were different categories. If you're interested in art or education or entertainment, you could click in there and there would be links to other places on the web. So it was just a way literally to find things in this incredibly, uh, this is actually even before, there was a time before where it didn't even have search. There was no ability to search here. Um, this was the first Amazon website. Um, and you can see very simple, just literally a website to sell books. Alta Vista was one of the first uh, search engines that actually allowed you to like type in stuff in the search bar and it would just very crappily look for any web page that had that search term in it. Um, and this was the, actually the shocking thing about all this is this was the first Google beta from 1998 and um, you can see that it's almost exactly the same. It's actually even simpler of a, more or less of a design, the Google homepage than it was here. Um, but the important problem is we want to be able to do fancy things and animations and being able to dynamically respond on the client because every time you clicked a link on any of these pages or hit the search bar, you're, your browser would then have to make a new HTTP request to the server. The server would process it, send the response back in the HTML, and your browser would then parse that HTML. But for sometimes you don't need all of that. And that became the birth of JavaScript. So I want to tell you a little bit about the history here. It was originally designed as a language to run inside your browser to interact and manipulate with HTML. How many of you know Java? Yeah, many of you. Great, JavaScript has nothing in common with Java except for the first four letters. Um, and this was actually a literal, um, so it was originally created in 1995 for Netscape, one of the browsers at the time called LiveScript. Thinking like, hey, you gotta like, script things live in your browser. It was renamed in December, 1995. Uh, literally, <laughs> um, JavaScript as an open cross-platform object scripting language for the creation and customization of applications on enterprise networks and the internet. This is in 1995. Whereas JavaScript in Wikipedia is a prototype-based scripting languages with dynamic typing and first-class functions. Uh, so this actually has nothing to do with Java. It's literally a different, like, it's the syntax is very similar because they both derive syntax from C, but fundamentally, like prototype based is very much in opposition to class and object orientation. So calling it an object scripting language is like super weird. Uh, literally they, um, they, it was basically like a marketing ploy because believe it or not, I know this may be very hard to believe at the time, but in like 1995, Java was considered the hot new language. Like, uh, I don't know, what's a hot new language that you all think is cool. Like, yeah, Rust. So this was like the Rust. Actually, it's a very good uh, app description because with Java, they told everyone like, hey, this is great. Um, you don't have to worry about buffer overflows, just like Rust. And you write once and deploy everywhere because you write it, it compiles to the JVM and different JVM implementations run on different machines. Uh, what it turned out was write once, debug everywhere was actually the real thing that happened. And so uh, anyways, hope in 20 years, maybe you'll remember this class and as soon as people you tell uh, people that you used to 
think Rust was cool and they go, ah, that's such an old language. Why would you ever think that? But anyways, um, in 1996, Microsoft added support for JavaScript to Internet, Explo Internet Explorer and it turned into a standardization. So the JavaScript language was standardized in 1996, but fundamentally it was just created for one browser to add some dynamic capabilities. And of now it is essentially the language of the web. So JavaScript is fundamentally the way that you uh, think about and is supported by all browsers. And it evolved organically along the way, which is why it's very, very weird. Uh, but let me show you some examples. So you use the script element or the script tags is the um, way of creating JavaScript. So you have script tags. Uh, this was a very, very old style of doing this where you had um, these tags here is a HTML comment. So it tells the browser, hey, consider anything in here to be a comment. And this was for browsers that didn't support JavaScript. That way they wouldn't show what was in the script tags. So if you're a browser and you did support it, you would know not to take off those HTML comments and you would start executing the code there. So you can do things like uh, there's a whole um, system and stuff, but it's very similar to what you're doing. It's not anything that's too crazy. So you can prompt things like, hey, please enter your name. You can set that to a variable called name. You can check if name is null, then write welcome to my site. Otherwise, write welcome to my site. And then the plus is concatenation here. And so you can do this. Uh, <clears throat> You can also specify exactly the language here, although this is really not needed now. Um, so you could run this page and it would say, hey, please enter your name below. You could enter something like Adam in and then it would say, hey, welcome to my site, Adam. Okay. Uh, you can also include external JavaScript files. This is actually not strictly needed for what we're doing, but something that's very useful is you can have a source attribute then have an absolute or relative URL. And so the browser, when it parses this, will make another HTTP request, fetch that content and execute it as if it was JavaScript code. Okay. I'm gonna skip all this. We don't need to do this. Okay. JavaScript though is, okay. So everything in JavaScript is an object and Guess what? You learned JSON way back when, when you were making web requests by hand in Netcat, those fun, fun days. Um, so JSON, those everything in curly braces in JSON derives from the syntax for JavaScript for objects. Uh, objects are pretty sweet. They're just like hash tables or arrays. You can add properties and values at runtime. So you can have something like var object equals, and so the curly braces is so this is an object that has one property named test with the value foo as a string and another property num with the value of 50. We can then, so objects, you can think of things that can be recursive. So you can have object, uh, and this is accessing a property. So this is with array syntax saying the object, the property with name foo set it to be equal to object. And we can log itself so we can do Object test is what here in this example? Foo, and then object foo is the object itself, because we set it here, object foo. We can set num to be a thousand, we can log it, and then we can look at it here in the console. Uh, one of the cool things is you can just, uh, if you're ever curious about how something works in JavaScript, you can open up your good old web browser here in the console. You can just put code here and you can just type it in. Uh, can I make this? Oh yeah, there we go. So I can type all this in here so I can look and inspect this object. So this is my object called object that has three properties, foo, num, and test. Foo is the object itself. So if you keep going down foo, it'll go down here forever. Um, one thing, so I use this syntax, right? Object bracket string foo. This is one way you can access properties. The other way is the dot syntax. So you can just say object dot foo and it's exactly the same thing. It's literally just, it's the same syntax 
the dot foo is this, just the same syntactic sugar for the exact same thing. Okay. Okay, I think that's all we need to do under here. There's much more complicated stuff. So what we can do is now we are here. So once we have this injection, we can write any JavaScript code we want inside of script tags. One of the classic things, uh, if you look up the alert function, So instructs the browser to display a dialog with an optional message. This is one of the ways that uh, as security analysts, we show that we can execute JavaScript code on your web page by making it pop up a window here. So this is JavaScript code. So this is when I refresh that, the very first thing it does, it's parsing this. And did the developer, the original developer of this website intended, did they intend for there to be JavaScript code here? No, this is only because we, the attacker, tricked the web application to include this JavaScript code. And so we can do whatever we want here. We can um, I think that's how you do it. Let's see. Nope. That's writing it there. I always have to look this stuff up. JavaScript overwrite HTML of page. Ah, dot replace. Document dot replace. Oh. Okay. Document open, document write, document close. That's a weird name. Body inner HTML. Ah, inner HTML. There you go. That's that works. works. It's all caps HTML. Boom. So completely changing the content of the page. Um, we can do. Let's see. You redirect is a document dot. Uh, redirect with JavaScript. I may have blocked it because of the domains. Oh, location href. That's right. Boom. So redirecting them to another place. Fundamentally, I can do whatever I want. I can, um, if the web application uses cookies, uh, which this one probably will not. Ah, it won't even let me go back. That's really annoying. Yeah, undefined because I don't have any cookies. Uh, let's insert some cookies. Storage, local storage, add new, password. Am I pulling after all those cookies? I don't know. JavaScript. Depends on how it set the cookies, but let me just double check. Cookie, not cookies. See, this is why reading the documentation is so important. This is why I tell you uh, what to do. And that did nothing. I can go to the console here, document.cookies, cookie, cookies. Ah, yeah, there we go. Cool. So if cookies were set, I could get them. I guess it should be like this. Yeah, it could be about the specific way that I set them. Um, if you could get them or not, there are like 
lots of possible security measures here, but fundamentally I can do anything. And this means that if I was now, and especially if you're logged into this website, I can now act as you as the user. So I could steal your cookies to try to log in as you. I could have you, the user, transfer me. Remember when we looked at the, uh, the bank transferring money, right, between things? I will, introduction. Oh yeah, here we go. Here's our good friend, the bank, right? So if I were able to trick blue into executing code from green from the bank that says, hey, transfer money $1,000 from red, the bank has no idea that this is coming from, not coming from the actual user. So you can really do anything um, there. Cool. Okay. Questions here? All right. <clears throat> oh, and I guess uh, uh, just for the record, when you go out into the world, this is called cross-site scripting. The idea being another and a criminal or a hacker got you, tricked your browser into executing JavaScript that they wanted to execute. So that's the cross-site. So, uh, and the abbreviation for this is XSS. So if you see that, that's what that means. Now, again, another case where people want to concatenate strings is with when creating SQL queries. So here we have a SQL query. Select star from users where username equals single quote Connor single quote and password equals single quote password one, two, three single quote. This was the example where we we're looking at SQL. So what's the point of this query? What would be a use case of this query? Yeah, why would we want to look for the specific user's information? Say it again. Louder. Yeah, so we're we're trying to check. So this would be an application where they're trying to check: Did the user provide the correct username and password? Right. So like, yeah, they're going to log in. We're going to check first. Hey, does there exist any user in this database that has the username Connor and the password of password one two three? If, if it does, presumably, then we would log the user in. And that's exactly what this query would do. Now, now, fundamentally, if we control what's in this string Connor and here in this password, we can fundamentally put in whatever we want here. So, Let's, do you guys want to try it on a real database? No? Where is there a real database? Um, oh, there we go. This is where you're just hoping that somewhere back in your history, somebody did this once. Okay, where do I have a web server running? Um, SQLite digital accessible? Such a pain, I don't like SQLite. Uh, okay, I think I have an idea. Let's see, I usually, I can quick, quickly install something on here. Can't locate the package MySQL. Oh, uh, it's MySQL server. Okay, we'll just install MySQL server on a random thing. We'll create the table. This will be super fun. And then we will hack it. Okay. It's running. Very good progress.
All right, now I'm into my SQL server, or I'm, I'm running. So now when I'm typing commands in here, this is as if we're running queries. So I could say selects, and let me make this bigger. Okay, it's going to say error, no database collected. Uh, so use, wait, do I create a database first? Use 365. MySQL. Okay. I did. Okay. Oh, I guess I can do that. Create database HackMe. Use HackMe. Create, what is it? Table users. SQL. Ah. Ah, data type. Varchars are great. Just means variable characters. Okay. I see. Actually, it should just work without the strings. Yay. Okay. Insert into users values, uh, admin, super secret. Uh, Want to make sure insert into users values, value one, value two. How do I do multiple values? I think it's just separated by commas like this. Okay. And let's go back to our thing. Admin password, a Connor. Okay, password one, two, three. Select. Hey, got data in there? Cool. Okay, now let's go back to our query. So we're going to simulate having a website. We are writing this statement. Okay, select, so it's gonna be select star from users where username is equal to name and password equals password. Okay, so let's run this. Okay, why did that return nothing? And we don't have anything in the database that matches that. Okay. But we did have the example of, why? Is there space in front of here? Why is this not saving this query? This is going to drive me insane. Okay. Connor. So now if we know Connor's password, we can log in and that returns one user. So our web application would say, great, user accepted, log in, awesome. Okay, that's so weird. So you can write in anything where into this string. Where do you, what do you control? The username and password, specifically after the single quotes, so why is the so the application is specifically uh, adding single quotes around your input because it knows that this is how you specify a string in MySQL. So specifically here and here we control inside of those strings. Awesome. So select star from users where username is equal to Connor. So we can put in if there's no restrictions from the web application, we can put in whatever we want here. So 
what might we want to put in? Yeah. Another single quote? What's the point of that single quote? So it matches the first single quote, and now, now what do you want to type in? Yeah, so or maybe. So we say username is equal to blank. One equals one. What do you want to put in for password? Let's just do password. Okay, what's going to happen when I hit enter? Yeah, it's not going to let me. I wish it didn't do this. Uh, oh, I have an idea. Okay, let's do, this was a great example. Let's do this, quit, sudo mysql, do you just write the command here? No, it's uh, first the database name, hack me, and then hash c. Did you actually write it the standard way? Yeah, that's right, okay, thank you. Okay, cool, because I wanted to simulate more of what happened, and as you saw, when we tried to enter that command, the MySQL uh, prompt wouldn't even let you type that prompt in because it has a syntax error. What's the problem? We put in single quote, space, or, space, one equals one, and then the application put a single quote, and password equals two, and then this single quote, but then there's a password, and then like a dangling single quote, right? So we're very close here, but the problem is we're not matching those things. And the problem is there's a bunch of gibberish that we have to deal with after this. So what was the trick we used in command injection in order to not have to deal with anything that came after us? What was that? Comment it out. Let's look up. I think we talked about it in the last one, but let's look up MySQL comment syntax from a dash character to the end of the line or from a, uh, or sorry, a hash character to the end of the line or from a double dash to the end of the line. Um, I'm gonna show you the double dash because the database you're gonna be using is SQLite and I wanna show you one that works on both. I believe it's double dash. Yeah, and so you can see this. Anybody remember this, uh, this type of graph? Back when we looked at JSON syntax. So here in SQL <clears throat> light, dash dash to anything except new line to new line will be a comment. And that's the same in SQL light and in MySQL. So we do this. Really hope that was gonna work. Why did that not work? Oh, I think we need a space. Yes, there we go. Why do we need the space? Because the characters were specifically a double dash without any space at the end. I guess MySQL is trying to interpret that as its own thing and doesn't really see the, uh, let's actually look, this is crazy. Ah, insane. I wonder if this is what messed me up on a CTF once. It's interesting. Anyways. Okay, so what did this do? Why did this return us all the results in the database? Yeah, so this is the query that we ran. Select star from users where username is equal to blank or one equals one. How many times is one equals one true? It's always true. And true or false is true. So this returns true for every single row in the database that returned all of the rows. What if we just wanted to return the admin? Rather than doing or one equals one, what would we do? Louder? Admin, and then what? If I do this, what is it going to do? It's 
Still going to return all. Why? Yeah, for all of them. So how do I fix it? Say it again. Cool. So now, <clears throat> let's say we do this on the login form. And we say, hey, we want to log in as the admin. Here's my password and password. But actually, I say, we don't want to log in as admin. We want to log in as admin tick space dash dash space. And it goes, it says, oh, yep, there's one result. That's good. Let me log you in now as this user. And then, boom, you've now logged in as the admin user. And we can even go, let's see, where are we going here? Make sure I'm balancing with time. Cool. Oh yeah, perfect. Okay. We can even go crazier than here. So let's do, let's uh, create table. I feel like I have that syntax. Nope. Uh, create table flag. Uh, Let's say there's flag, that's a bar char 255. Okay. Insert into flag values pong get get this flag. Okay. So Let's say we get this output. Well, let's say it's not uh, the username and password, but whatever. We get this output, but we can control. So again, we can control anything in password. We kind of figured we don't need to do that because we can deal with anything that's in here. So we can just by changing this username. Now, can I control anything that happens before the username? Select star from users where? No, we cannot. But, so we can use this as we saw to get anybody's username. We can also, so let me, did, did we talk about that? MySQL get tables. So let's look up. Yeah. Cool. So it turns out two things we need to look at. One, let's go back to just our normal MySQL. Ew, gross. Okay, that's too many tables. Oh, this person sucks, okay. Table schema test, I haven't seen that. MySQL. This has a ton of information. Let's see. DB5. Okay. Okay, here's. Oh, am I not? Wait, did you use hack me? Okay, I feel like this should be a lot easier. Okay, there we go. Yeah, okay. There we go. Why does that reveal so much? I thought there was like... Okay, well here is our hack me, 
and here is the users and flags. So it's table overflowing. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. But what do we put for table? No, oh, table underscore schema equals database name. Where is that? Oh, base table. Hmm. Uh, let's just do a select all on that. This is something you can look up, by the way. It's not. Uh... Yeah, well, where is the. Oh, God. What? Okay, but why, why is this? This should be very simple. <laughs> what are you trying to select? I want you to see the tables. But just the user tables. Like, why is there all this? There's a bunch of junk tables. There's 330 tables. I mean, if you want to make it slightly simple, it's table underscore name with an end of column. So it's that star. Yeah. I would like this, but with only the user table. Right. This is definitely a way to. Oh, they're right at the top. But. Uh, All right. I will find this. No. OK, that was going to be a cool little demo. All right. Oh, but that's what I want. Inject all the things. Payload, there we go. Payload all the things. That's what I want. Okay, this has everything I could ever need. Cheat sheet, MySQL injection. Uh, MySQL, oh good, it has all the comments. Testing, yes, okay, great, great. Extract database with information schema. Thank you. Tables. That's annoying. Oh, schema. Okay, great. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So these are all the different databases. Excellent. Okay. And then, ah, there we go. I hate how it does this. I see. So I had to first figure out what the database name was. <laughs> okay. Ah, and I can just do the table name. Got it. Okay, now I figured out how to pivot here. Okay, perfect. Where were we? Cool. Okay. Okay. Whew. So we are back here. Select star from users where username equals blah. Okay, this is where we were. Great. Now, let's say. We have our tick. Now, <clears throat> everybody remember our friend, the union syntax, which was used to union two select statements? Yeah, so how many columns did, we, did our users table have? Two columns? 
We may or may not know that, depending. If we don't, we can actually just keep guessing. We can do foo bar. Uh, that's right, let's just go, we'll go like this. Okay, there we go, that's the syntax. So this select foo bar. So if we did, and what's super interesting, you won't have to get into this, but oh, it does do that. So you can figure out how many columns are needed by just keeping adding one to the select statement until you get the correct, you get an output, a non-error, everything else errors. So what this does is says, hey, select star from users where username is equal to nothing, which we don't care about. Union that with select one, two, three. Well, select one, two, three is not very useful and select foo bar is also not useful. Why is this not useful? Yeah, or this foo bar, like we gave that input. So it's just proving that what we give comes back to us. But we gave that, so that's not interesting. Um, but I don't know even know where the data is that I want. But I know by looking it up in that... Uh, payload all the things that I can select in my SQL and other database engines have very similar things. I could say select and that's going to fail because that has the different wrong number of columns. So what I really want from here, where did I want from uh, schemata? I want the schema name. Select schema name. Again, not going to work because what I'm unioning has one column on the right side and two columns on the left. So I just need to add something. So this shows me that, hey, there's the MySQL schema, information schema, performance schema, sys, and hackme. Ooh, hackme sounds good. Let's figure out all the tables in hackme. So now I can use my other query. Now that I know that, I can do, where was my query? Oh, there we go. So now I'm gonna union that query with select star from information scheme dot tables where table schema is equal to hack me. That will not work. So I want, I believe it's just called table. Table name. So table name, I have flag and users. I'm already querying all the all the users table. So which data do I want? Like which table do I want of these two tables? Flag. We want the flag. Let's get the flag. I actually, from here, I don't know what the columns are, but you can actually read if you really want to. You can read all the columns in that table, so you can figure out of the flags table, what are the columns there. But we can do that here. Now that I know what table to search for, select star from flags, wrong number of columns, so I actually now will need to do that. So let's select dot columns where table name, okay. Select star from columns where table name is equal to flag. Okay, wrong number of columns. I will do column name. Aha, there's a flag. So it should just be select flag from flag. That won't work because of the wrong number of columns. Flex flag, comma one. Ah, there we go. So now I've finally got the flag. So fundamentally from doing this, you can actually uh, get, are the parentheses necessary around this, this select statement? No, they're not. It just helps me when I was doing that. Uh, that was a question on Twitch. SQL syntax is almost a little too forgiving, so I like to just be very careful there, yeah. Yeah, so this just means, so, so 
So what I'm saying is, hey, select from the table flags. And for my results, I want the first column to be flag, whatever is in the database as flag. And the second column, I just want to be one, like the literal one. So that's what this does. This just makes, this just returns one for the password. I could make it return a string as foo. I can make it return whatever I want. I could put flag twice, but the important thing is because the, with the union, the select on the left, the users table has two columns that the result when you union them has to have two, otherwise it can't put them together, right? It's like, think about like building blocks, right? You have like, like Legos, you get the size two and you had a one and try to put that on there, that's not gonna work. If you had a three, that's too big. It has to be exactly the same size so that your, your application gets all those same results. And the crazy thing is, do they, I can't remember, do they do this in the assignment of, uh, of blind? Yeah, so what's crazy is you can, so we were able to read the flag here, why? Because we can see the output here, right? In this table, we, we see these results. The application may or may not give us the results here. So um, one, so there, but you can do uh, really cool things. You can actually, and there's a, I guess I don't have it installed. Um, do we have it installed on the dojo? No. So <clears throat> we can do cool things like da, da, da. okay, let me see how I want to do this. So certain users, you can select. Let's see. There are, hey, there we go. So we can actually do things like select, or let's say we can't get this, so all we're getting output is foo foo. Uh, but we can say where left flag. Let's see, string length, let's say one. So, so what I can do is I can set up a SQL query such that if it returns something, if it, if it returns a result, if the first character of the flag, so the left, this left function I just looked up from the documentations specifies the number of characters from the left of the string. Both the number and the string are supplied as arguments of the function. So this would be the string and the length. So I can iterate over this and brute force all the characters from A to Z, big A to big Z, zero through nine, and what's the difference? How do I know if I'm correct? Oh, wait, why did that work? SQL must be case insensitive. That was not what I meant to show. This is the problem when you just copy and paste random stuff. Okay. I 
Uh, SQL case sensitive comparison, MySQL. So I know it's not A, I know it's not B, but when I get to P, so why is that? So, so let's say the application will give me an error if there's nothing or give me a page like a 500 versus a 200 error. So the only thing I can see, I can't see what it returns. But I can know if my query gave zero results or non-zero results. So that's what we're doing here is by checking and taking the flag by creating a where clause such that by creating a where clause such that I have a condition based on part of the flag and a value that I supply, I can then test and I can make 255 of these queries for each character. Um, I can even, let's see, my SQL, SQL function or Python. There's a way to like turn it, yeah, there we go. No, not Python. Yeah, ORD. Just like, ah, it is ORD. So just like in, um, In which we call it in Python, we can call ORD on this to turn it into an integer, and then that will not work. But if we do man ASCII, let's see, P is at seventy, and capital P is going to be at fifty, and these are hex. Aha, there we go. So now we found a way to determine the case of this. So if our program in the first case gives us a 500 error, we can use that. So this is the crazy thing is with one bit of information, whether the query returns something or doesn't return something, we can completely, we can use this to brute force this. And what's even crazier, uh, so what's faster than a linear search through zero to 255 to see which one hits? Somebody's taking 310? Yeah. Yeah, so it's faster than a linear search. So rather than searching zero, trying everything, zero to 255. binary search. So I can do something like, because I don't have to do equality, I can do less than or equal to, right? So I can say, is, is this less than, and I would do what's in the middle of 255 and uh, 255 divided by two, let's say 127, which it definitely will be. So this is a yes. So I got a yes response because I got something back. So, okay, so I can do zero now between 270, 275. So I can do 127 divided by 2, 63. Nope, it's not less than that. So I know it's somewhere between 63 and two, 127. Uh, 63, uh, this is what doing this by hand is kind of a pain, but this is why you have computers. 96. So it's not, so it's between 96 and 127. 112. 112. Okay, it's not that, Connor, you're, the, you're a great oracle. 120. Yes, so it's between 120 and 112. 116. 116. Yes, so between 116 and 112. 
118. 118, yes. 119. 119, yes, also yes. I have to check equality at some point, right? Something is wrong? Oh, Connor. Connor, Connor, Connor. So it's not less than 112, but it is less than 120 and less than, I see. Yeah, so we should have gone down after 18, right? Uh, so we should have done 114. We will find it. Correct. Yes. Not 112, so what does that mean it is? Yeah, or so. It is Yay. And. Well, you know, we are not computers. It's OK if we're not doing the binary search properly. Yes, there we go. OK. Oof. That's octal. So it's octal, decimal, and hex. So it's P. So we figured out the first character. We can do, yes, thank you. There's much rejoicing from the audience. Um, oh, shoot. That took a long time. OK. So we first have to then put everything together of why is this safe? So as we talked about with JavaScript, you have basically random code that you're downloading onto your machine. And the whole point is that your browser wants to ensure that different websites and different tabs, you can think of as tabs, can't really mess with each other. So when you're accessing something and you're including images there from let's say red and from blue, your browser will then go and fetch those and it can, um, yes. So when you, so uh, the way this works is it gets to the, what is the same origin policy? So the origin is this three tuple of scheme, host, and port. Scheme being HTTP or HTTPS, host being the domain name, and port being the port of the connection. So anything that where those triple is the same, it, it exists in the same origin. So for instance, um, HTTPExample.com has the, oh, I hate, this is uh, the dreaded Google Slides to uh, PowerPoint conversion. Uh, Example.com, the root site has the origin HTTP, Example.com and 80 which if you're fetching cat.gif from there, it's the same HTTP example.com 80. Whereas if it's from a different origin, even if it's the exact same host and port, that is a different origin. Different port is a different. And so you can send cross origin requests if there are, uh, wow. All right, uh, sorry, we're at the end of time. We're gonna have to, we spent too much time on SQL injection, but uh, we'll do this on Wednesday.